Sciences of the University of Cyprus. The Livonian series of lectures has become one of the most exciting academic events of the Open University of Cyprus during the last three years. I'm especially happy to welcome our special guest this evening, Dr. Lynn Fender, Associate Professor in the Department of Teacher Education at Michigan State University. Lynn is currently on sabbatical uh, leave from uh, MSU and serving as visiting professor for one year at the University of Luxembourg. So we are thankful that she accepted our invitation to fly from Luxembourg to Cyprus and deliver this lecture. My friendship with Lynn goes back a decade ago. We met in August of 2000 while we were both hired as visiting assistant professors at Michigan State University. I was immediately struck by Lynn's depth of thinking and wealth of knowledge on curriculum studies, linguistics, educational theory, food, music, and world languages. She speaks several languages including Thai, Chinese, German, a little bit French, and Greek. Uh, the more I knew her, the more impressed I became with the diversity and complexity of her thought, her commitment to scholarship, as well as her kindness and generosity. Lin studied philosophy and Asian studies, Chinese history, applied English linguistics, and curriculum and instruction. In the early 90s, she taught English as a second language, in, as a second language in refugee camps in Thailand. Many years later, when we both taught in Thailand for the MSU Overseas Master's Program, I had the privilege to visit with Lee the house in the small village in which she had lived years before. Teaching English as a second language is one thing. Teaching English as a second language in a refugee camp under conditions of unimaginable poverty and hardship is a completely different thing. Without a doubt, Lynn was the best teacher and the most valuable friend and colleague I had during my stay in East Lansing, Michigan and in Thailand. I learned more from her Foucault and critical theory than spending hours and hours reading about them in graduate school. I consider her the world leading scholar on Foucault in education and so we are lucky to have her tonight speak about some aspects that touch on what she calls Foucault as teacher educator. Her most recent book introduces the work of Michel Foucault to teachers and was published a few months ago and I highly recommend it to everyone. Lynn published numerous articles in journals, book chapters, encyclopedias and other edited collections on various issues uh, on her research interests. She's interested in the political and epistemological implication of Web 2.0 technologies and she maintains a week to serve as an open public and interactive resource on the philosophy of education for teachers and educational researchers. Her current research projects include studies of empiricism, methodologies for humanities-oriented research, and the educational problems of aesthetic taste. I could clearly go on and on talking about Lynn and her truly remarkable achievements, her publications, her teaching accomplishments, her social and community service, and her humanity, but I know I will embarrass her further and she will think I have become less posthuman in Cyprus, so I will stop here. Agapiti Mufili, thank you for your friendship and thank you for accepting our invitation. It is with great honor and joy that I welcome you tonight. Thank you so much for having me here this evening. And my special thanks to Mikalios for the overly generous introduction. Um, in the world, I don't think there is another educational researcher or teacher educator who has done more to advance the cause of human dignity through education than Mihalinos has done. So I really, I really think that's true. 
in the world, that's true, and he's famous for that. So I think Open University is extremely fortunate, and I am also extremely fortunate to have him as a longtime friend and colleague. Uh, what a beautiful country you have. Um, I'm traveling here with my husband, and we are both thoroughly charmed with the natural beauty and the kindness and warmth of all the people that we have met. So I, I feel very fortunate, and um, thank you for having me tonight. Um, this just shows that I'm on sabbatical at the University of Luxembourg this year. Okay, next. Okay. Here's a short little outline of the kinds of things that I'm going to try to cover today in my talk. Um, most of you will recognize the picture, that's, that's Michel Foucault, uh, and those of you who know his work will hear echoes and tints and um, ideas and inspirations from his work and some of the terminology. Uh, sometimes the most um, inspiring figures for us take us away from their own theorizations, and that's something about what's going to happen today. Uh, first, I'll offer a few different definitions of ex existing definitions of power. Then I'll sort of map the field, how I see it, uh, give you an idea of the context of the debate in which I am participating. Um, and then, in the end, I'll offer something that might be new, a contribution that we haven't seen before. First, let me check in. Can everybody hear? Can everybody see? Am I speaking too fast? Okay, if I am, please wave me down. Thanks. <laughs> All right, we have two, generally speaking, existing definitions or conceptualizations of power. One that comes from uh, politics or uh, political science, and another one that comes from physics. They are not the same, and they serve different realms. So definitions of power within politics, um, the most common framework that we see in the social sciences, we see power in terms of antagonism or conflict, and we see power as a zero-sum game. Zero-sum meaning when who has more power than someone else must have less power. So it has to balance out to zero. All right. Within physics, we have a very different conceptualization of power, the rate at which work is performed, or energy is converted. Now, to this existing definitions of power, tonight I would like to suggest another, one that is specific to teachers and to educators. But first, let me show what good are theories. Actually, I lost a graphic here. I'm sorry. You can see a little writing there. There was this lovely little fish there, but somewhere in the <laughs> transfer of the PowerPoint, I lost my graphic. Um, so, mono to exit no psari diakrini to nero. So, this is what, theory, what theories are good for to help us see the water in which we swim. To see beyond what we take for granted as natural, as inevitable, as this is what the world is made of, the value of theory then is to help us see what we take for granted so that we can then imagine alternatives. So when I suggest that to the existing definitions and conceptualizations of power, I would like to add another one. For the moment, I'm calling it literacy of power, although I have to be honest to say I'm not entirely happy with that word, um, and maybe you can help me with some questions later. Maybe we can improve on that. Um, the conceptualization of power I want to offer is one that changes how we think and talk about power, no longer defined within the frameworks of politics or physics, but rather defined very specifically within the framework of education for teachers. Okay. All right, that's the overview of the things I'm going to talk about. Now, in the next section, I will 
map the terrain. That is, give a picture of how I see the field of debates, how I see the arguments and theories about power to give you an idea of the environment in which I am trying to make a contribution. All right. Uh, what I think is that, for the most part, teachers and students, along with their, most everybody else, is quite good at recognizing some kinds of power. Especially, we're good at recognizing structural power. Structural power shows up in terms of institutional hierarchies, demographic inequalities, acts of dominance and oppression. These are real. This, I'm not saying that we need to uh, say that replace this with another thing, but I think we need to make more um, precise definitions of power to cover situations that are not covered by structural theorizations of power. So I want to add nuance and detail to this. Specifically, and those, and you will recognize this from most of Foucault's work, is offering vocabulary and conceptualizations for power in the contexts of democracies, in which we are supposed to be governing ourselves. So, for teachers, my goal then is to have us be literate about more different kinds of power than the ones that are obvious. So what's an example of the kinds of questions that a teacher might ask about power in a classroom? Here are three. How do students learn democratic citizenship? And you, you are probably familiar with the debates in the curriculum theory. How do students learn about democratic citizenship? Not only from the explicit official curriculum, but also from the enacted or in, sometimes implicit curriculum, how the classroom operates, what kinds of rights students have to speak in the class, what is the relationship between the teachers and the students, how do rules work. So people learn about democracy in a classroom not only by reading about it and learning the rules, but also experientially as a member of a classroom society. What's the difference between power and resistance? This is a question that I think arises in structural definitions of power that has bothered me for years, maybe decades, where I couldn't figure out why the person in institutional leadership position was said to have power when they acted. But people who were in institutionally uh, subordinated positions were never said to have power, but only resistance or agency. And I've been struggling with this problem. Why is one called power and the other one not called power for a long, long time? So you will see that part of my theorizations here address that problem that bothers me. OK, what's the difference between power? Uh, what kinds of power are possible between students and teachers? I think this is a question, uh, again, that theory can offer us because it helps us imagine beyond the natural and what we take for granted. All right. Generally speaking, um, I'm just laying out how I see basic fundamental differences between structuralism and post-structuralism. Um, I'll be working sort of between the two. I personally find post-structuralism to offer an imaginative way out of a lot of theoretical tangles, so um, you, I don't treat them both uh, equally. All right. How I understand uh, structuralism and structuralist uh, way of looking at the world is that we must look at the world as if it had two layers, two layers of reality. There's the stuff we do, the phenomena, the practices that we do, and then underneath that, is a regularity or an abstract pattern under, lying underneath that we read. And structuralists 
for the most part, believe that reading the underlying layer of abstraction is what true science must do. The underlying layer of abstraction and patterns is um, we can make it regular. On the other hand, in contrast, all the practices, they're all messy, right? People do all kinds of things that don't fit into regular patterns. Generally speaking, structuralists prefer to work with and um, theorize about the underlying layer. And it is within this setup that we get the assumption that the structure has power and people have agency. You can, if you, I understand that I'm speaking in very broad strokes, and so maybe afterwards you can raise some questions. On the other hand, uh, as an alternative to a structuralist view of the world, we have a post-structural view, which perhaps is obvious, that rejects the idea that there is this two-tiered reality system, this practice on the one hand and theory on the other hand, uh, sorry, and structure on the other hand. And in many cases, at least for the case of Foucault, what we do is we study the messy practices. Very messy. Which makes theory a different kind of thing because we can't usually make generalizations, we cannot predict things as well because surface practices are very messy, right? And the assumption then from the post-structural way of the world is that power can come from many directions, not just one. How are we on this? Maybe not so sure. Okay, we can come back to this if we need to. It may become clearer a little bit better. Okay, next. All right, so with that, we just had a, a general view of the field, structuralism and post-structuralism, and now what I'm doing is a little bit more clearly into theories of power between structuralism and post-structuralism. In structuralism, the assumed context, as I read it, is what I would call sovereignty. What that means is someone has power. Someone has power. That's a sovereign conception of power. Um, there are assumptions about dualisms, structure and agency, center and margins, domination and oppressive. And as far as I can see, within most structuralist way of talking about the world, power is a bad thing. Here's another thing that bar bothers me a lot, that power is always a bad thing. Agency seems to be a good thing. Power is a bad thing. Where do we go if we want power for a good thing? Right? If we want to exercise power as a good thing, we, within most ways, structuralist ways of looking at the world, we don't have that option. And that's another one of the problems that I'm, I'm struggling with here in this idea. So, on the other side, the post-structural, the assumed context, is democracy. It, so, the assumption is, it is theoretically possible for everybody to have a voice for votes to happen, and for people to govern themselves and participate in their own governance. It's a different assumption than sovereign power. In Foucault's words, it's not that someone has power, it's that power is exercised. And anyone can exercise power. Um, what we have then is within a democracy, several modalities. These are Foucault's modalities of power. Sovereign power is one thing that does exist in a democracy. We have police, we have jails, we have um, sovereign um, administrators who exercise power in that way. But that's not the only thing that's going on. We also have disciplinary power, which for Foucault is how knowledge, how our knowledge governs us, um, biopower and pastoral power. For tonight, I will be emphasizing pastoral power in the last part of this talk. And as a big thing, power can be either good or bad. So, as a general rule, in a structuralist view, power is bad, agency and resistance are good. 
in a post-structural world, there's not a normative value placed on power. Power could be either good or bad, exercised by anyone. That's a separate moral judgment. Can be bad, can be good, but that's a separate judgment. So power doesn't have this normative thing. Okay. All right. As far as I can see, both structuralist theories of power and post-structuralist theories of power have problems. They're not clean, um, and these are the what, what I see as the problems in the theories. Um, for as far as structuralism goes, what is structure apart from human actions? It's like what is an institution other than the collective practices of individuals? What is it? That's a problem, I think. Hasn't been thoroughly theorized. Um, within structuralism, are dominator and oppressor our only choices? Is that all we have? Um, why is agency not power? And how can we account for resistance? Where does that come from? I, I don't think any of that is taken care of. And in the problems in post-structural theories of power, what exactly is it? How do we recognize it? How do we account for patterns of inequality? And how can we judge what is good or bad, right or wrong? I want to tell you a small story from my teaching about um, different kinds of power here. Uh, I have been teaching for almost 30 years, and uh, in an effort, this is some time ago in my teaching, in an effort to be a very democratic teacher, uh, I asked all the students to write their own participation rubrics. So most of teachers have, you know, you have to speak in class so many times, you have to post so many responses to uh, other students, something like that. So I said, okay, I'm going to put that grading mechanism however many points it was, into the hands of the students. And they would design their own participation. You tell me what counts for participation. You tell me how it's worth, what you want to do. You want to be a good listener? OK. You, you, you give yourself points for that. You give yourself points for working in, in pairs. If you don't want to speak in the whole classroom, that's OK. So uh, I put this into the hands of the students, who then wrote all their participation rubrics themselves. After several semesters of this practice and reading all these participation rubrics, I have to say that they were more rigorous and more demanding than any participation rubric I have ever made myself. Not one time did a student ever say, look, I got three kids at home, I have to take care of my mother, I'm working full time, I just want to get my master's degree. Now, I'm going to do the best I can, read these things, but maybe I won't, you know, get all the assignments done. I'll read as little as possible in order to get them done. Not one time did a student ever write a participation rubric like that. And I have to look at the possibilities that all oh, they thought they would get repercussions. But really, they knew me pretty well by then, and they knew that whatever they wrote for their participation rubric, that was it. I had hands off. They had to do, uh, they had, so nobody ever did it. And I had to then, given this evidence, I had to say, <laughs> what kind of power move is this? I mean, this is a strange power move. This is a power move that I don't understand um, within structuralist vocabulary. So I have, I've been working with this. And the uh, concept, I'm not going to talk about it tonight, but the concept of governmentality helps me a lot to understand, to read, to be sensitive to, um, power relations in the classroom that couldn't be explained within structuralist frameworks. Okay. All right. Um, here's what I see. Um, moving slowly now into um, my conceptualization of power for teachers, the literacy of power. So here's the basic outline of how I'm uh, contrasting my conceptualizations of power with existing ones. Within um, structuralist notions of power, 
when we have agency, our options are to resist, to join in solidarity, and to advocate empowerment. What I want to suggest is a conceptualization of power in which we read power, interpret power, and speak and write the language of power. To, to be clear, I am not saying that um, literacy, if you, you like, knowledge is power, or that the more literacy you have, the more power you have. That's, that's not what I'm saying at all. In fact, I'm shifting it from uh, um, reading words to reading power. Uh, it's a little bit of a difference. So in order to be able to read power, in order to, for example, decode power, recognize it, uh, speak the language, uh, uh, develop the vocabulary of power, and have the syntax to talk about power, this is what um, I want to talk about, the literacy of power. All right. So to get rather concrete, if we think in terms of literacy of power in the classroom, what exactly are we reading? What parts of our classroom experience are analogous to the text right, that we, we would interact with, that we might read? So these are just a few possibilities. Uh, one thing is the distribution of talk time. That can be one of the things we read in order to understand the relations and dynamics of power in a classroom. What are the conventions? Who asks questions? Who answers questions? To what degree do conversations happen um, away from the teacher or away from particular students in the classroom? Uh, sociogram patterns. Everybody, everybody knows, has seen sociograms. This is a. This, the illustration here is a sociogram. When you are looking at a classroom, um, those are people, and whenever a uh, communication occurs, you can mark that, and then you can see, for example, in a classroom when a lot of people have attention and some people are never included in the uh, communication patterns. So this is a very concrete kind of an example of the sorts of um, activities that happen in a classroom that can be read uh, by using a literacy of power here. Okay, next one. Another aspect of literacy of power is genre. Analogous to being able to recognize literary genre, like comedy and tragedy and being recognize those, we can also recognize genre of power as it's happening in the classroom. And here are two possibilities. The genre of truth and power in which we ask these questions. What's really happening? Who's really right? What's the objective of reality that we all share? But that's not the only genre if when we are literate about power, we will also recognize not only the genre of truth, but the genre of critique. What can I say that will make a difference? What, analog what analysis will be most pedagogically effective? What approach will enact the most respectful relationship? Different genre of questions. And to recognize those dynamics is part of the literacy of power as I see. One of the problems, of course, as we know in post-structural theories, is how do we account for patterns when we see a predominance of interactions happening of, of, in one direction? Well, uh, within structuralism, we can recognize patterns of power and we explain them through institutional relationships like teachers versus students, administrators versus teachers. Those are structural relationships, and those are fixed patterns that we understand in demography um, or um, institutional patterns. So that's one way. Another way to understand it is 
historical patterns, discourse practices that are contingent and contextual. So what that means is it's not necessarily that only the teacher who is exercising power. So it's not, a, it's not defined by an institutional relationship or a demographic relationship, but rather in a historical practice at the moment. Okay. There are whole different sets of how we might judge value, how we might decide what's good or bad, right or wrong. As the general rule, the structuralism of the dominance is bad, agency is good. General rule, when post-structural effective is good, un unquestioned assumptions are bad. So we can see that we're in two very different realms, different kinds of questions that get asked. And when with literacy of power, we have this vocabulary to help us distinguish different genres of power, different genres of critique, and different genres of, um, and different vocabulary for value judgments. All right, so um, as an example of the sort of power and vocabulary for teachers, I'm going to um, do the last section here on pastoral power. Uh, some of you will be familiar with Foucault's definition of pastoral power. Uh, the notion of pastoral is pastor as the shepherd, and um, so the pastoral power is a power that is caring, nurturing, the flock is dependent, and rebellion does not make sense. For the most part, I think that this describes most classroom situations. Of course, there are some abusive teachers, but not very many. <laughs> That's usually not what happens. Um, in my experience, uh, almost all the teachers I have ever met are caring and all they want to do is the best that they can do for their, for their students. So how can we recognize this in terms of power? If what we are doing is caring and nurturing and it doesn't make sense for a class to rebel against someone who is taking their best welfare into account. How we can recognize uh, some of the things, the mechanisms that carry or vehicles of pastoral power in the classroom include lesson plans, activities, homework, timetable, curriculum textbooks, and modes of participation. I'll tell you a small story about a, um, a, one of my students' research projects, actually. She had a, uh, she was making a video with a bunch of immigrants and a bunch of uh, long timers. She called them newcomers and old timers in the class. So she was working with people who were trying to learn English as a uh, second or third language. Um, and she was studying how these newcomer and old timer students worked together to build a video. And in part of her analysis, she recognized that pretty much all the students wanted to help. There was this helping thing going on. The old timers wanted to help the newcomers. The newcomers wanted to help the future newcomers yeah, uh, and each other make a way. Helping becomes a very complicated power move. Who gets to help whom? Who decides what needs help and what doesn't need help? What kind of intervention gets called helping? <laughs> so I find that these relationships of helping with the language and vocabulary of pastoral power are more accessible to us. We can see it, we can read it, we can interpret it, and we can speak to it with the language of power, especially in things like Helping. Here you come. All right. So why is the literacy of power important? Um, this is what I'm working on now. It seems to me that if we, as teachers, have only at our disposal the definition, the 
of physics, the framework of physics, and the framework of political science, then there are certain tools we don't have. We lack conceptual um, abilities. Within, if we define power only politically, of course we must sometimes define power politically. That happens. We're not replacing this. This happens, right? If we define power politically, power is contentious. It's something to fight about. We speak in terms of ideological conflicts. We speak in terms of right and wrong, good and bad. But if we add to that another nuanced conceptualization of power that derives from an educational point of view, then power is interactive. It is something to get smart about. It requires strategies of interpretation and response in a generative kind of way and requires effective and accessible tools for its development. Okay. So this is how, I'm um, just wrapping up here now, the literacy of power for teachers and students, literacy to read, recognize, identify, and interpret power, the capacity to speak and write in the languages of power. Last. It's my conclusion then that when power is in discourse, when we have it to speak of, when we put it in words, then literacy is an effective tool of critique. Thank you. Good evening and thank you for your speech. It was very um, uh, enjoyable in many ways. Uh, I'm concerned and I have a question, I'm not concerned. My concern is too, um, too heavy. Thank you. Um, I have a question about the positioning of, of agency under the structure of uh, perspective of power. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering if uh, there's no place for agency within the post-structural approach to power. And I'm thinking that, in, especially in light of um, the theorization of um, um, Judith Butler or Debbie Udell, who tried to see the possibility of agency within structures. Um, and so, even though they're not just drawing on quote, but they're drawing different people. Um, but I really want to listen to what you have to say about that. Thank you for your question. Okay. Yes. Um, should I just respond? Yes, let's respond to this one and then we have another one. Uh, okay. Yeah. All right. Mm, as I understand it, um, I, I'm, I've been reading Judith Butler's notions of agency, so I, I think I understand the context of your question. There are two ways to go, I think. Um, it's like you uh, reject a term or redefine it and reclaim it, right? So we can do either thing with the concept of agency. Um, since many people really think agency is the, is the one thing that means we can do something, Many people have taken that concept and redefined it, like Judith Butler. Right. Um, the other option is to say, the concept of agency only makes sense when we have it in contrast to structuralism. One option is we, we get rid of bo both of them. We, we get rid of the whole package, and we start looking at things differently, so that human action and possibility, and what I want to call power, can be talked about, experienced, and thought of without the dichotomy of structure and agency. Those two words become ir irrelevant. It's a conceptual setup that 
is only one of many possible conceptual setups. It's possible to say, I'm not going to use that one. I'm going to use another set of ideas to talk about human capacity and power. I don't know if I addressed it. Yeah, I think it was a question. Okay. Um, I wanted to thank you too, first of all, for coming here in the cold and traveling. I'm afraid oh. I brought it with me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, thank you to Michalinos for bringing you here. Um, I do enjoy the talk, uh, and you try to make uh, complicated ideas. Um, sound simple, and uh, you did a wonderful job, but we still have questions. Questions okay. are wonderful. Um, one of the very first questions I had since you started, and eventually you answered it for me, was why is it power? Is it power a bad thing? It is power a bad thing? You know, and that's, that's something that came to my mind away when you started talking. And um, I'm glad you addressed that before the end of your talk. And along the same line, so in, in essence, you said that um, um, post-structuralism looks at power in different ways. Um, along the same lines, I wanted you to speak about democracy as well. Is, in, in the opposite way, though, is democracy always a good thing? And why do we even care about it? In, in what ways is it that we care? Um, my... Um, uh, Real question, though, um, regarding your talk, has to do with the relationship between agency and literacy. When we talk about the literacy of power, a different way to think about power, uh, the way I understood it was that you wanted teachers, educators in general, to start shifting from agency towards literacy. In what ways this can happen? Um, you know, an easy answer would be you send people to a good teacher education program and they get them to start thinking about these ideas. Um, but as we know, it's very, very difficult to do in the classroom. Um, so how is it that we help people shift from agency to literacy in thinking about power? And how is this helping the business of democracy? Isn't it where we eventually want to reach? I mean, is, isn't this, why is it that we think about these ideas in the first place? Is democracy our final destination, or is it something beyond all this? Thank you. Thank you. Very nice question. So the first question, I believe, is, um, is democracy always a good thing? Um, there, I will offer two possible ways of responding to that question. We can regard democracy in structural terms, or as some people would say, in essentialist terms, in which we look at the underlying patterns and certain should-bes, these, these things that should be in a society, and if we take that point of view, then probably most people would say democracy is a good thing. In contrast, we can look at democracy from a post-structural point of view, in which we look at the practices, in which case it might be hard to say this is democracy and this is not democracy. <laughs> because it will get very messy. And we might see, using the language of post-structural power, we might see democratic relations at one moment, at one corner of the room, but other kinds of relations, sovereign or abusive, at another moment in another part of the room. That's what the historically contingent part is. And that's why, with post-structuralism, it's so difficult to generalize. And theories are not the same. Theories are not grand narratives in which you try to explain a huge array of things. I'm talking about a different kind of value. 
I'm talking about the literacy of being able to detect, to read, and to interpret the sorts of relations that are going on in a classroom from time to time, from assignment to assignment, and in different parts of, um, different parts of the classroom, and in relation to different people, relation to the curriculum, relation to the administrators, students' relations to, to students. The literacy of power allows us, I think, a finer-grained perception of what, how those relations can be described. So I think maybe this moves into your second question, shift from agency to literacy. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to go to? Yes, uh, we have a question over there. Um, she's a colleague at the university. Uh -huh. uh, do you want to read it or can you read it, Lynn? I can, yes. Okay. But maybe they can't. Uh, thank you very much indeed for a very exciting lecture. I was particularly intrigued by your suggestion that the recognition of discourses of and around power is part and parcel of critical literacy. This is, in fact, what we are trying to implement in the new Cyprus Curriculum for Language. I was wondering, though, to what extent do you think this is feasible within the remit of school literacy, or if you will, within the macro genre of classroom discourse, which, as we all know, has enormous potential for generating and upholding discourses of power almost by definition. Okay. Um, thank you for this question. It's a wonderful question. Uh, the way I want to respond to this is to say, um, I, I, I want to think of literacy as something quite different from agency. And uh, I recognize that I'm not as um, clear about this in being able to make the distinction as I need to be. Um, again, just as from a post-structural point of view, democ democratic relations may or may not be, we don't know if it's necessarily a good or bad thing, we can say the same thing about agency, right? We can say the same thing if we choose to look at the world in terms of agency. Um, what I would like as a theorist is the capacity to name acts of power in something other than agency or structure, power or domination. This is what I would like to do. Um, I am not, sh I don't know actually anything about implementation, <laughs> and I don't know how I would suggest. This seems to me, a re um, if people are interested in it, effectiveness of implementation is probably an empirical question. It's a way of trying things out in a classroom. Uh, at this point, uh, I am interested in engaging in the theories to, uh, it's the seeing the water thing, to open up possibilities for what power might mean in the classroom so that uh, educators can begin talking about power with more precise vocabulary and reading discernment and interpretive power. So, and did you want to respond to this? Okay. Any other questions? I have one question here. Can you speak a little bit more about um, the ethics of care? Um, there is a lot of you know, debates, especially in, in feminist studies, about the ethics of care. And I, I, I'm wondering how you get away with you know, pastoral power um, and not um, you know, remaining kind of grounded in a structuralist um, philosophy uh, while taking into consideration, you know, the benefits from the politics of care. Especially when it comes to citizenship as well. There's a lot of um, discussions lately about how the ethics of care, uh, ethics of caring for immigrants, for example, can create a new sense of citizenship, not in the nation state, grounded in the nation state, but um, in a kind of different framework. So I was wondering about your reactions to this. Uh, let me uh, check to 
see if I understood part of your question. Um, did you suggest that to use the term pastoral power puts you back into a structuralist uh, set of assumptions in some way? What are the yeah? What are the assumptions behind it? Behind pastoral power? Mm -hmm. I mean, considering you know the discussions about the ethics of care. Um, okay, as an opener, power is not a bad thing, care is not necessarily a bad thing, <laughs> I'm not saying these are bad things, I'm s saying they're dangerous, how surprising, right? So <laughs> I'm saying that without literacy of power, we may not recognize caring as a power relationship in the classroom. Mm -hmm. So that's just the first step. To break out of the only possibilities for power are institutional or structural or dominant. One of the options is within pastoral power. You brought up the ethic of care, um, which I really didn't address at all. Um, and I, I would say that the ethic of care can be a, a, a beautiful thing and a wonderful thing, and it can be a bad thing. It doesn't have a necessary normative value on it, as far as I'm concerned, or, or it, it might have, but that's not me to judge until I see exactly, and that's, or, or when you are making judgments about pastoral power, that you would make the judgments. Um, from a distance, oh, I, how, how can we make it into a good thing? Not, I mean, I'm not saying, obviously, going into, um, uh, not, I mean, observing the practices. So, um, but for, for teachers, how can an ethic of care, a citizenship, like grounded citizenship on a totally different framework of thinking, how can that be a good thing and make an argument out of it to convince people who are against an ethic of care, citizenship? And, and, you know, I mean, build up an argument that this, this is not necessarily bad, but it can actually have good things about it. I'm, I'm struggling to, to formulate an argument that could convince somebody who is totally against it and against, you know, the presence of immigrants, against, because this is a kind of a radical argument to make, uh, an ethic of care citizenship. Mm, my guess is that you know a great deal more about that than I do. Um, it sounds like, uh, when I hear your question, it sounds like a question of political strategy. Mm -hmm. Political and rhetorical strategy. Right, right. So that is very grounded, very local, and very specific to place. Um, the kinds of arguments that are effective in one case with one audience are not going to be effective with another case in another audience. So but it's part of your literacy of power, right? Um, strategizing, political strategizing. Don't you think it's part of your definition of literacy of power? That you would, uh, that people would become more skillful mm -hmm. at articulating mm -hmm. what they mean. Yeah. Uh, perhaps this is closer to, right, the, right, to right, where your right. question is. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so with the literacy of power then, we have the vocabulary, decoding, syntax, um, and comprehension and composition strategies to express our views directly. Okay. Yes, yes, okay. yes. Thank, okay. you. Thank you. Any other questions? Andros. Reverse. <coughs> <coughs> 
είδα ότι μεταφέροντα σε ένα άλλο πεδίο, θε να πει μέχρι τώρα. Αν σκεφτούμε το education σε ένα άλλο πεδίο, όπω α πούμε το education στι φυλακέ, πώ μετασχηματίζεται το literacy of power στο οποίο μα αναφέρεται τώρα. Okay, let's see if I can uh, translate it. So the question is about how the literacy of power that you described translates in a different field of action like education in prisons. So dealing with prisoners, right? Yes. Okay. Mm. Yeah. What, what I understand about the literacy of power is that it gives us um, capacity to understand a variety of power relations. <coughs> and I think I stated it was particularly suited for assumptions of democracy and in a classroom condition. Um, I've never taught in a prison. I suspect that there are a great deal of, um, that sovereign power is a pretty major thing in a prison. Is that true? I was not in prison. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I wondered if that's where your question was coming from. <laughs> I just, because που ασχολήθηκε με το θέμα και έδειξε κάποιες και με τον πολιτικό του ακτιβισμό έδειξε κάποια ελάχιστα κριτήρια αλλά ταυτόχρονα με τη φιλοσοφία του έβαζε θεμελιώδη ερωτήματα εμείς πού βρισκόμαστε δηλαδή Α, ναι, απλώς ανάφερα ότι μεταξύ του πολιτικού ακτιβισμού και των θεμελιωδών ερωτημάτων που έθετε για κάτι το literacy of power So, so he's asking where, the, the, where does the literacy of power exist um, in, in Foucault's um, kind of philosophy, given his political activism and, um, and the kinds of questions that he asked? The fundamental questions. Uh, like the rights of prisoners and the mm. rights of... Okay. Um, yes. Uh, Literacy of power does not belong to Foucault. That's <laughs> it belongs to me, actually. Um, how I understand Foucault's theories is that he wants us to recognize that there is more than one modality of power. This is what I think is one of the most important contributions. He, of course, recognizes that abusive power, sovereign power, exists everywhere in the world. But that's not the only kind of power that we have. It's not the only. There's lots of other kinds of power. Sorry? I don't suggest something like this. Oh. Like this. I just ask yeah. uh, if this is the anastomata schematiza de capos and yours, You mean uh, the literacy of power? Yeah. If the literacy of power is transformed in, in certain domains, in different domains like prisons or schools or other, other, or institutions. other institutions, I, I did not suggest anything. I'm sorry. It's my fault for not being able to. Uh, it's my my weakness here. So. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure I, I understand the question clearly. Uh, what I would like to do is suggest that literacy of power is conceptualizing power for teachers in classrooms. Very, very specific. Uh, for the most part, um, ed education borrows concepts from other disciplines. Very often, right? Borrows from sociology, from anthropology, from political theory, from uh, from humanities, from literary criticism. Um, I'm flipping that. 
I am beginning with teachers and education and offering a theorization, conceptualization of power that is very specific to a teaching situation. I think I, I was allowed to come to that was generated by Foucault's theories of power that say we have lots of kinds of power. I'm not sure I addressed the question. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, you did. If I may add, yes, please. Is, um, I find that a powerful political move at the same time. I mean, your argument that uh, education is the point of departure right. rather than other, you know, disciplines. Yes. And the 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 notion of the literacy of power, I, I find that at the same time politically, but within the education field. And I think maybe somebody could make the argument that it can be transferred in other uh, disciplines as well. If somebody is interested in, you know, in a notion of a literacy of power in other domains, so in a sense, you can transfer the idea. But again, as as Lynn said, it depends on the context and the field and the you know power relations that you find. Jim Marshall, for example, invented the concept bizno power, B-U-S-N-O, so kind of a business. He um, is also an education theory, but wanted to wanted us to be able to see how business and business discourses were driving educational policies. So he invented the term bizno power um, for a very specific reason in a very specific context, and that's what I'm speaking to. Mm -hmm. Yoda. Um, I have my remark regarding the, the term like literacy of power yes. and you said that I mean you you sort of coined it because you want to suggest that there is a third way in which I see things. And um, perhaps um, I was thinking that uh, when I read the title of the presentation I had something else in mind. Mm -hmm. So I would like to suggest that um, in order to introduce something new, uh, maybe you should use something like the Bizno power. <laughs> and sort of um, that uh, terminology in the sense that it's um, like literacy and power. They are terms that are very old. They have been with us um, very established in very um, specific fields. And they have been connected between them in various ways in the literature. So um, there was a, um, a misrecognition at the beginning. So maybe think, um, use a term that it's, it's more, it's more, you know. Do you have an idea? No. <laughs> I'm sorry. Peda <laughs> power, paideia power. I don't. No, I, um, I, I agree with you. That, yeah. Yeah. And my other question was um, related to how you see your work relating to the field of um, critical literacy and critical pedagogy. Because many of, the, I mean, you talk about structuralism and post-structuralism, structuralism, and um, I see where that fits. But I see many elements in your work that could be attributed to um, a critical paradigm which is not acknowledged and I was wondering uh, how you relate to that pool of thought. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. And it's actually related to your first one because the word critical also comes with baggage, conceptual baggage, you know. Yeah. So I have to make a rhetorical decision. Uh, about whether to mobilize that and risk a mixed recognition exactly like the one you pointed out. That's true. Yeah. Um, for the most part, um, the word critical, I think, has now been fully appropriated by the structuralists and or neo-Marxist kinds of things. For a while, I think, it was in flux. Um, I know uh, with the Critical Theories of Power book in 1999, um, we tried to advance that the word critical could pertain not only to the mark, but also to all these other persons. But I think that that didn't happen. Um, my read of the discourse is that it belongs to the Marxists, so, or the neo-Marxists. Uh, do you agree? 
I, I do. I mean, yeah. there's no need Yeah. So I have to make a rhetorical decision about whether to abandon it or to redefine it, you know, again, the same kind of thing. But you are, I agree completely that there are many, many overlapping uh, concepts. Yes, thank you. Well, knowing Yota, in, until you leave, she will come up with a name. Oh, so, all right. So, well, so okay. to put pressure on you so. now, by Saturday, you have a new name. Any, any other questions? Look here. Just one final thought. I think um, what, what Lynn brought for us today, um, thinking about the teacher as the pastor or the, or the shepherd, is really, really very important, very fundamental. And it goes back to the question you had about what is problematic about the ethics of care. Okay, and I think what she's saying is that sometimes in, um, you know, in our best uh, intentions as teachers, but we go in the classroom um, having this package. First, first of all, who goes to become a teacher? People who care about kids. And that's not a bad thing. But um, I think what this notion of the literacy of power offers us um, through me is that it's, a, it's um, uh, important to problematize um, the teacher as the pastor, and seeing um, if we see the teacher as the pastor or, or the shepherd, then the students are the sheep. And we don't, this is not what we want to do education about. <coughs> this is not why we go into education to look at students as sheep. Uh, so, um, thank you for this. <laughs> Thank you, Lucia. Yeah, please was join. Hello to everyone online. Thank you for joining. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming.